First Chronicles 16, beginning with verse 23, midst of what's called David's Song of Thanksgiving, it says, Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him, strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Good morning. Our uh, first two songs will be 943 and 982. We'll sing those back to back. There we go. I'll have to get this thing up here fixed because I'm used to looking down here and seeing what's up there. Uh, 943 and then 982. If it's convenient, would you stand, please? Six hundred eighty seven, six eighty seven.
Before our prayer, we'll sing number 71. 71. <clears throat> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. Merciful, loving, heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, thankful for this another day, Father. Thankful, Father, for the opportunity to assemble here with brothers and sisters of like precious faith, Father, to lift up to you the, the worship of our lips, Father. Pray that the songs and, and prayer and, and the offering that we give to you today, Father, will be acceptable in your sight. Pray, Father, that we would remove the things of this world from our minds and our hearts and to focus on you, Father. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity every Sunday to gather around the table in remembrance of your son, as we'll do so here shortly, to reflect on the sacrifice that was made on our behalf so that we as Christians might have that hope of eternal life with you one day, Father. Father, we're thankful for all the blessings of this life, not just the spiritual blessings, but also the physical blessings, Father, and we know that you bless us in so many ways. Father, we're thankful for the, the homes that we live in, the clothes on our back, and the food on our table, Father, and we know that all these things come from you. Father, we're thankful for the return of our campers from Blue Haven, Father. We're thankful for their safe travels, and we're mindful, Father, of those that have left for Bandina. We pray that you'll give them a safe journey. Father, we're thankful for our youth group. We're in the summertime now, Father, and camps going on and all the many things that they get to participate in, summer youth series and, and so many other wonderful experiences that they can uh, participate in, Father, to encourage them and lift them up. Father, we're mindful of Kevin and the lesson of the hour that he'll bring to us shortly. Father, we pray that you'll give him a ready recollection of those things that he has prepared and that, my, that our hearts would be open to, to receiving that message, Father, and that we might look for application in our lives where we can better serve you each and every day. Father, we're thankful for our shepherds. We're thankful for our deacons. We're thankful for our teachers. We're thankful for all those that work behind the scenes and all the various works that we have here at Brown Trail. Pray your continued blessings upon the preacher training school and the um, 
Truth and Love Program, Father. We pray that these works will, will bring many uh, uh, to you, Father, that are lost. Father, we uh, pray that you'll be with us now as we continue through this hour of worship. Forgive us of our sins, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Song prior to the Lord's Supper will be 784, 784. <clears throat> be reading from Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 through 17. Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those things through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people.
pray with me, please. Gracious, loving God, our Heavenly Father, how awesome is your glorious and magnificent name. Dear Lord, we're so thankful that we can gather around the table and partake of this memorial this, and concentrate on the events of that day where your only son, Jesus, the, the perfect Savior, took our place on the cross. He was so willing to shed his precious blood for us so we can have the forgiveness of our sins. We do know and remember, dear Lord, that this bread represents Christ's broken body. We pray that we take this in a respectful manner and we keep our minds clear as we concentrate on the scriptures and the, the events of that faithful day. It's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on the webcast of our worship assembly. If you're unfamiliar with worship assemblies and churches of Christ, allow me to explain what we're doing. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas and turned over to his enemies to be crucified, the Lord gathered with his apostles to observe the Jewish Passover. At that gathering, he inaugurated a new practice to be observed in the church after his resurrection and ascension back to heaven. This memorial involves eating and drinking items that symbolize his body and blood. Listen to Matthew's account of this event. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. Then in the next verse, Matthew 26, 29, Jesus informed the disciples that they would not observe this memorial again until the kingdom was established. And when the kingdom, also called the church, came into existence, the disciples began to observe this memorial regularly. Acts 2, 42. How regularly? Acts 20, verse 7 reveals that on the first day of the week. It's our desire to follow the example of the New Testament church in all essential matters. That's why we do as they did and observe this memorial to Jesus every first day of the week. Bow our heads again, please. Our Lord and God, we approach thee again, thanking you for the fact that we can come together as members of thy son's kingdom, singing songs and praise, hymns and spiritual songs, and hearing a word from thy word, the Bible. Forgive us of our sins, help us to live the life that we need to be living to please thee. And it's in his name, thy son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. According to the New Testament, the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper involves more than remembering Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us, though that is the primary emphasis. 
The Lord's Supper also affords time for personal examination. Listen to Paul and his inspired teaching to the church in Corinth. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 26 through 28. As the church continues this memorial observance today, we're not only thinking about what Jesus did for us on the cross, we're also thinking about ourselves. We're looking deep within our hearts and examining our actions to see if our lives have been a proper reflection of our gratitude for what Jesus did for us. So this is a valuable time each week for the Christian. We gratefully remember Jesus and we humbly examine ourselves. According to the New Testament, the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper involves more than remembering Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us, though that is the primary emphasis. The Lord's Supper also Number 724, sing verses uh, 1 and 2. <clears throat> Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we take this time to give back as we have blessed. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the many things you've given us, our wonderful lives and families, jobs, homes, our health, many, many ways which you, you watch over us and bless us and take care of us. And as we've made us stewards over many things, we pray, dear Father, that we are 
we take good use of those blessings which you've given us and we apply them properly. We pray, dear fathers, we give back to you this morning that we might give with an open and cheerful heart. We pray, dear father, that the money would be collected this morning to be used for your service and for spreading the good news in this area and throughout the world. We pray, dear fathers, to be with us through all of our endeavors that we might be cheerful and mindful that everything we have is, is not ours but gifts from you. We pray us in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul gave the following instructions to the church in the city of Corinth. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. For a congregation to carry out its necessary work, it must have operating funds. The passage we just read serves as our example for gathering Brown Trail's monetary resources. It's a simple free will offering. If you ever visit with us on a Sunday, we will collect an offering, but our guests are never obligated or pressured to give. The passing of collection trays is just an expedient way for us to fulfill God's desire that our members support the church's work. I love the Song of invitation will be 714, 714. Will you turn in your New Testament with me to Romans, the fifth chapter? Romans 5. Here we have Paul's, in just a few verses, speaking great volumes about the love of God for each of us. Let's begin in verse 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. 
and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3 verse 16 has provoked in many people some at least semblance of faith, of trust that God cares. As a matter of fact, when we turn and we consider these basic ideas, we oversimplify them sometimes. Trust God. We're going through a difficult time. Someone says, trust God. That's good. You're wondering whether or not what you're doing is the right thing. Trust the Bible. That is also good advice. Just trust Jesus. It is true, but like the others, so often we oversimplify it that it is, becomes a shallow kind of sense of understanding. And when your understanding is shallow, so also will the trust be. Despite the way the religious world portrays these ideas, they mean a lot more than simply, I believe. After all, the demons believe and they tremble, James chapter 2 and verse 19. However, God does not simply command that we believe on him and trust him like some dictator that's drunk with power. Not at all. Instead, God has given us many worthwhile reasons why we should trust him. And at the core of these is this very simple and yet profound fact. God has demonstrated his love for us time and time and time again. And this should be reason enough to trust him. We see his love for us all around us in creation. The stars, the sun that provides warmth, The moon that reminds us of time, the beauty, the provision of our needs, they're here for you. God did that. We see his love around us in the impact for good and civilization that the law of Moses provided if we recall that it as a basic form of law and order serves as the foundation for most strong laws that are given and governments that exist when it's followed. But most of all, we see the love of God in Jesus Christ. So much so that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, it says that the love of Christ constrains us or compels us. It motivates us to do the right thing when we see how much love we've been shown. And that's why it's important for us to remember that God's word reveals far more than just his wisdom. It also reveals his love. A lot of times people don't turn to God's word because they're afraid of the do's and don'ts. And they lack, therefore, appreciation for the depth of love that he's shown us here. And this love, deep and abiding, should cause us to trust him and trust his word in a deep and abiding way, too. So this morning we want to look at a number of reasons why we should trust. And we begin with this. Trust God because he loves consistently. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, there the prophet says, quoting the Lord, I am the Lord, I change not. Now that's a statement of, I don't go back and forth on my standards, but it is also a statement of being true to his character, that when God loves, it never changes as to the nature of how he loves and what he does in love and that he loves. God, because he is infinite, once we understand that he is a loving God, you can be assured that he is always, in everything he does, a loving God. God's love for his creation does not vary with the seasons. It doesn't jump around like the stock market. His love consistently is there because he loves not out of circumstances, but out of his own character. 
And that is why it can say in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, that it rains on the just and the unjust. That means you get blessings when you don't even deserve them. There's a certain level at which all of mankind, God determined when he made us, because we are his creation, to provide blessings and display his love. Consistently, without fail. God also loves us every day of our lives. All of these things continue. You take it for granted that the sun will come up in the morning, that oxygen will be here for you to breathe, that there is food around, and there's some means available that you can go about your business. You can get up with that assurance because God loves us. And that's meaningful in context. God loves us even when we've rebelled against him. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. He loves us during our greatest triumphs, and he loves us during our darkest defeats. You think about David in Psalm 51, have mercy upon me, O God. He had sinned greatly, and yet he knew God loved him, and he was appealing to that as he called out to him. God loves us during those times, even when we fail to love him. Think back to Luke 22. Jesus is on trial. He's already warned the disciples that they're going to all flee. Peter says, I won't. And when Peter denied him that third time and the rooster crows, Jesus looked at Peter I do not know what it looked like, disappointment or just a knowing look. But I do know this, Jesus still loved Peter at that moment. He loves us when we ourselves are not lovable at all. Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, was loved by God in a greater way than he ever could have imagined. And that was proven on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. God loves us when we don't even love ourselves. That's how consistent God's love is. God consistently reaches out to mankind with unmatched care. And because God loves so consistently throughout all these times, so also should we trust consistently, come what may. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Job 13, verse 15. Second of all, trust God because he loves with your best interest at heart. Everything God does, he does to help us, not hurt us. I'm going to say that again. Everything God does, he does to help us and not to hurt us. And he does that specifically because of how much he loves us. Every command he's ever given has been designed to help you. Every condition he has made for mankind is designed for our own good. Every one. Everything he's done from the beginning of time down to this very moment has come from a heart that wants what's best for you, both right now and for eternity. The problem is is that we ourselves allow the world to blind us and Satan to deceive us. And as a result, we often do things that themselves are bad for us. But God doesn't do that. He knows what's best. He wants what's best. So much so that he was willing to do what was worst for him so he could offer what's best for us. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, friends, that was not in God's best interest, but it was in ours. God has your best interest at heart because he understands your needs and your best interest better than you do. 
He knows how important safety and security matter, which is why he created the concept of government and instituted and established the idea of law and order in the first place. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. You see this in his punishment of Cain in Genesis chapter 4, 10 through 11, as well as in his exhortation to Noah after the flood in Genesis 9 and verse 6. He understands that we need work that's productive and helps us provide for others. And he shows us how best to do that in Colossians chapter 3, 22 through chapter 4 and verse 1, whether you are the worker or the employer, he's telling you, here's how you do this and it works best. He sees the benefits of having a good and happy marriage because he designed it to be so. And that's why he's taking the time to teach us. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, here's what it takes to have a good and happy, successful marriage. He doesn't do that to demean us, to make it hard on us. He does that to make it best for us. He knows that we want our children to be successful in life. But we also want them to love and respect us. And that's why he's shown us the way in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. God understands our need for an active social community where people really belong and people really care. And that's why he gave us the church. He knew that we needed one another and we needed a place to turn to and people to lift us up, to encourage us, to make us stronger and to make sure that we know we belong to God because we belong to his people. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. John 13, 34, and 35. But most of all, God knows this life does not last forever. And that's why he's made it possible for us to enjoy joy in eternity. This is the promise which he hath promised us, even eternal life. 1 John 2, verse 25. But God also knows best how we can have all of these things. And that's important because we really don't know. You try to come up with your system and your way, you're not going to get close to this. You end up with selfishness. You end up with people being rude. You end up with situations where people do everything they think to follow after the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, pride of life. They do everything and they destroy themselves. God knows that all of this then takes discipline and maturity and that's why he disciplines us to get us to that point hebrews chapter 12 verses 5 and 6 god knows that seeking holiness can lead us to happiness but that seeking happiness does not lead to holiness and that's why in first peter 1 verse 16 he says be holy because i am holy saith the lord God wants us to be with him in eternity. He does not want us to be separated forever. He wants you to be with him because he loves you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you, James 4 verse 8. And because God wants what's best for us, we can always trust him to tell us what is best for us and do what is best for us always ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free john 8 verse 32 number three trust god because he extends his love to us through mercy and grace we take this for granted in many ways it's important that we don't God does not love us in a distant, aloof sense of caring from afar. Somewhere out there is God, is the idea. No. God loves so deeply, so intently, and so personally that he opens his heart and his hands to those he loves to care for us in our deepest need. He knows how much you need and when you need. And he opens up to you and loves you. Our sinfulness, 
our transgressions and iniquities? Let's be honest, they're too numerous to count. I don't know the last time you tried. We've all sinned, without any doubt. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. But more than that, we've all sinned so much that we ourselves cannot recount all our failures. Jeremiah 30, verse 15, talks about the multitude of our transgressions. It's like trying to pick them out of a huge crowd. But God can. God knows each and every one. And I know usually when you hear that, it's heard in terms of the idea of how judgment's there, and he knows. But here's what I want you to think about then. If God knows each and every sin you've ever, ever committed, remember that rather than holding that over us like some villain who's toying with our emotions, he reached out with mercy and grace to save you. He knew all the sin, still does. He chose to meet them with mercy and grace, Ephesians 2 verse 4. While he had every right to strike us down for the depth of our wickedness, our God chose to lift us up through the sacrifice of his son. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. John 1 verse 1. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1 verse 14. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. John 1 verse 18. So rather than immediately condemning us, God sent his Son to deliver us. The verse that follows John 3, 16 is important. In verse 17 he says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. His mercy saw us as a people to be pitied rather than an enemy to engage. And friends, you would not have wanted to try to go to war against God. So he cared for us even when we abandoned him. And his love is far more than just holding off punishment. Because when we see Jesus, he favored us with hope of salvation and so much more. He didn't just say, okay, I'm going to come down and turn a key and, and let's start over. He offered us real hope and real purpose and a real future. The mercy and grace of God that's made possible by his love are the foundation for the call of the gospel and for brotherhood unity. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. They're the heart by which we not only can enjoy a renewed relationship with God, but also the means by help by means which we can help one another. That we can cover a multitude of sins as we go and try to help one another come back out of the depths of our iniquity. James 5, 19 and 20. Grace and mercy have never been our right. You can't cash in grace and mercy. We deserved everything but grace and mercy. But God, because he is God, bestowed his blessings on us anyway. So much so to the, to the point that we can come boldly before him now. Because it's a throne of grace, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. And I submit to you that this is reason enough to trust every word he's ever uttered. Number four, trust God because he loves enough to offer us freedom from guilt and hope for the future. You know, men try to assuage their guilt in so many different ways. You see, they can't get away from the guilt, so we've got to find a way to deal with it. Some revel in their guilt. Some have, I don't know, parades maybe. Some ignore their guilt don't know what you're talking about. Some bury their guilt deep within, put it in the past, don't want to talk about it. Some hide their guilt, 
They know it. They don't want anybody else to know it. And some people are just overwhelmed by their guilt. They know what they've done and they don't know what else to do. Only God can provide true freedom from guilt. And that's true because our guilt stems from something far greater than some psychosis. It's more than just a childhood misunderstanding that's our problem. Our sense of guilt comes from that moral sense that was placed in us by our Creator. We have the capacity to know right from wrong. But that creates a spiritual problem. We're created in the image of God, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And that means we have the full capacity to bear that image. In Mark chapter 12, verses 14 through 17, this is Jesus' point when he lifts up the coin and asks whose image is on the coin. Caesar's. Will you give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but to God the things that are God's? Well, what's God's? Where's his image? We fail to do so, though. And that's why we're guilty. Romans 3, verse 20. But Jesus offered himself as a propitiation for our sins. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. That is an atoning sacrifice. He reached out to say, here's an issue with sin I can meet everything that God needs for judgment by my sacrifice. And that's what makes freedom from guilt possible. So that we can be restored in that right image of righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24. And that means there's real hope. There's hope for the future. There's hope in eternity. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. And that means there is hope for you. Trust God. He wants to forgive you. He wants to forgive and save everyone. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. He wants you to have hope. He wants you to have a future with Him. And you can have all this. But you have to trust God and do things His way. And considering all these things, why would we argue? Fifthly, Trust God because, listen carefully, He loves with all His heart. When people first turn to the Scriptures, they sometimes have trouble accepting the changes that repentance requires. God does expect us to do things differently, to live differently. But people can see only that list of do's and don'ts because they're measuring God's Word by their own experience rather than their experience by God's Word. And because of this, people often act as if God's asking too much when he calls on them to trust and obey. Now, there's no question that God expects our all. No question about it. He expects all of our love, Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. He expects all of our life, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. But expecting all of our love and in all of our life, he gives them back to us. In a greater abundance yet, John 10, verse 10. I'm come that they might have life, yea, that they might have more, have it more abundantly. But here's what people don't realize in their own plight and the extent of God's love. They don't consider this that before God asked us to love Him with all of our heart, He loved us with all of His heart. He loved us so much we could never repay it. God holds none of his love back. None of it. Now, that doesn't mean there's not justice there too. But their love reaches as far as it's possible for that love to go. He's given us everything he possibly could give. He loved us from the moment he created us. He loved us in making a world that is just right for us. He loved us in sustaining us even while we had sinned against him. He loved us in saving the world when all but eight souls had rejected him. The Gentile world had turned their backs on him entirely, but he loved them. The Jews rejected him time and time and time again throughout their history. But as the book of Hosea demonstrates, 
he never stopped loving them. When mankind has ceased caring for himself, God still cared, and he sent his son, holding nothing back. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. When his own people rejected him, John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, and then crucified him, Jesus accepted going to the cross, holding nothing back. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And after raising Jesus from the dead, rather than destroying the cruel world that would do such a thing, he offered that world everything in the gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans 1, 16 and 17. So whatever God asks, whatever God requires of you, remember this, God has always given more. He has always given more because he loves more. And by giving all of himself on our behalf, he is giving us every reason to trust him with our souls. Finally then, trust God because God is love. Many people have issues trusting others because they've seen how flawed people are. If you've got trust issues, it's probably because you've got experience with people. They often have experienced letdown after letdown. Those closest to them have betrayed them, turned on them, hurt them deeply. You're not alone. Beyond that, people know themselves. They know their own failures in trust and not being trustworthy. And therefore, they have trouble trusting anyone completely. And a lot of times people end up looking at God the same way. They'll trust him to a certain extent, but they trust themselves more. And therefore, the extent they know that they are trustworthy, that's as far as they'll let themselves trust God. They come to him with doubt and fear rather than openness and care. They spend their time looking for a reason to mistrust instead of seeing all the reasons to trust implicitly. But that's because they have a very small view of God. They see him as if he were just as flawed as we are. Like some God of a Greek or Roman myth rather than the true and living God. And because they have a false view of God, they feel justified in not trusting him. And in a sense, they cannot accept Jehovah God. They cannot accept Jesus. They cannot accept the gospel. Because they sound too good to be true and almost are. The reality of God is greater than the imagination of all those who doubt him. They are arguing whether he can make a rock to build for him to lift. And in the meantime, he was busy loving them with a love too large to comprehend. God loves because God is love, First John 4 verse 8. God loves because of who he is, not because of who we are. He needs no other motivation than his own character. And this perfect love wrapped together with perfect light, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, and perfect spirit of John 4 verse 24 presents perfect holiness. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 16, as the perfect character of a perfect God whom you can trust perfectly. To truly know God is to see love on display. And therefore, trusting him is not just a beautiful thing to do. It's the only thing to do. So my friends, you can trust God fully and completely. You can trust him with your family and should. You can trust him with your future and should. You can trust him with your heart, and should. You can trust him with your soul, and should. 
You do not have to trust God with a blind faith as if the outcome is uncertain. You can trust God with a faith full of conviction because his character is good, his motivations are clear, and his love deep and abiding. God loves with a consistent love. God loves with a selfless love. God loves with a gracious love. God loves with a forgiving love. God loves with a full and complete love. God loves because God is love. So today I plead with you, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. 1 Peter 5 or 7. Our love for God should rise up to meet the love he's shown us. We love him because he first loved us, 1 John 4 verse 19. And as he reached out in love in sending us his son, We need to reach back to him in love by trusting and obeying his word. 1 John 5 and verse 3. By trusting it is the answer for all of life's problems in faith. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. In trusting Jesus is the answer because Jesus is the son of God who gave himself on the cross for our sins and was raised the third day and that we trust him because of it. John 8 verse 24. To trust God to tell us what we need to get out of our life in repentance. Acts 17 verse 30. Because he knows best what we're capable of and what's best for us. To trust the message of the gospel and be willing to say it and speak it and stand for it through confession. Not just once here in an assembly but everywhere. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And to trust and obey when he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. God wants to forgive you. He calls on you to be baptized so he can. God loves you with every ounce of his being. And that's why we should trust him with every ounce of ours. Whether we trust him, how long we trust him, And how much we trust him is essential. Because only through our faithful trust and obedience through life will we get to enjoy the love of God for all eternity. If you've never become a Christian, you're the one who's missing out. Because you're missing out on God. You're missing out on Jesus. You're missing out on his people. You're missing out on salvation and forgiveness. There's no reason to. Those of you, most of you are Christians, how much do you trust your God? Not just to save you, but trust Him enough to live for Him. He loves you so much. Let's trust Him more. If you're subject to the invitation, would you please come while we stand and sing?
I'd like to take this opportunity to, am I getting replaced? <laughs> you are not replaceable. <laughs> You know, I get in trouble a lot, so I just figured I was in trouble right there. <laughs> I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our visitors to uh, coming and worshiping with us. It is always, always good to come together of people of like precious faith and to sing songs and praise glory to our great creator and to his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. So we're grateful that our visitors are here worshiping with us. Now, in front of you are some uh, attendance cards, both visitors and members. If you'll fill them out, pass them to the end of the aisles. The boys that have been assigned will uh, pick them up. When you exit the building, also remember to pick up bulletins because this is just a summary and more detail are found in those bulletins. The morning coffee crew will not meet for the next two weeks, so remember that. Tuesday night for the Masters will not meet this week. Vacation Bible School, June 17th through the 20th, four-year-olds through fifth grade. Parents, don't forget to register your children at the Info Center or on our website. Roy Deaver will be teaching the adult class on the book of First John. U series is Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Azel Church of Christ. John will not uh, go to, John has gone to camp, so he will not be driving the bus and it will not be available. We are grateful for our Blue Heaven campers. And we're glad that y'all are back safe and sound. Uh, we're grateful for the sponsors and had, good, had a good week and you made it home safely. I know that was an answer for all of our prayers. Remember now going forward that Camp Bendina is also occurring, Camp Hensel and Camp, camp Ada. So let's keep all of our kids in prayers for those three camps as well and pray for their safe return. Just wanted to take a quick moment and say thanks to this congregation and I would like to ask everyone that went to Blue Haven this week to stand. And uh, we had 19 campers from, from Brown Trail and then we had an additional 13 friends that went with us that were campers as well. I want to say a special thanks to a couple of couples, uh, Brian and, and Melanie Birmingham drove out and picked up some kids from from uh, the airport. I also want to say thanks to Donna, uh, to Rhonda and Derek Baker for driving out and taking a look at camp. I also want to say thanks to Kevin this morning. Uh, it was like Kevin was there this week because what he preached about this morning is exactly what we talked about all week about being in Christ and grace and mercy and trust. And it was, it was very eerie to hear him talk, and, and that's exactly what we talked about. Brown Trail, awesome. We got some great kids. And thank you, parents, uh, for, for allowing us to do that. It, it, is, it is a phenomenal uh, thing to have kids that you're so proud of and uh, we are blessed here and there's a great group at Bandina that's starting a week there and a lot of our staff are down there so continued prayers for them if you guys want to talk about youth camp you set aside about 10 hours and I'll sit down with you and we'll talk about it uh, it's life changing and this congregation has taken hold of that idea and supports it, and uh, I think we're a better church for it. Thank you. And I will say that that man needs to get thanked, too. He's been doing this for a long time, ever since we started having kids, which is a, I can't remember when that was. Uh, <laughs>
Number uh, 727 will be our closing song. Sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Let's be standing, please. Holy Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the grace of time that you have given us. We're thankful for it and grateful for the opportunities that it allows us. Thankful for the Lord's day and the, rem and the reminder of the love that you gave us. May we trust in our hearts, dear Heavenly Father, that you will be true to your word and to your son's holy doctrine. We're thankful for uh, Christ, our Lord and Savior. We're thankful for his great sacrifice, and our, we hope that our praise and in song and in prayer has been acceptable to you, uh, for it is through his name we prayed. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for our children and their safe return. We ask that you be with uh, those that have gone off to the other camps today. May they have a, a safe week. Keep them from harm and incident. And may they learn from your word what you would have them to do. We're grateful for this congregation. We're thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that when we leave here today, that we will go out into the world and that the world may see uh, in us Christ and his doctrine. And that the love that we hold one for another, dear Heavenly Father, will be seen by those around about us. Grateful and thankful for all that we have, dear Heavenly Father, from the air that we breathe to the sun that shines, for everything that we have is from you. We're thankful for the church. We're thankful for your word. But we are grateful and thankful, dear Heavenly Father, for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. I like those boots. Oh, I, yeah, these are those. The